Hey, discussion leaders. Um, our lesson this week is going to be uh, a little bit different than usual. Pushing out our fall calendar this week, I just sent it to parents. And so Sunday, we're going to give that to students, put it in their hands. And I want to take a good chunk of time to actually go through that calendar with students, make sure they understand what's coming up, and then hopefully uh, ignite some excitement and some passion for them about what we're going to be doing this fall. Um, and then I also want to take a good chunk of time to really focus on this challenge that we're going to give students Sunday. Uh, we're doing our once a month Sunday night gatherings here at the church that we're going to call the rendezvous. And we're going to have that be an evangelistic focus this fall. So the sermon series is going to be geared towards people that don't believe the gospel. And so we're going to challenge our students to invite their friends that are unchurched, that don't uh, know Christ as their Savior and bring them to those gatherings once a month. Um, and we set a lofty goal of uh, 30 students. We want 30 new students that are not connected to another church that don't believe the gospel to come into our doors over the course of those five gatherings this semester. And so I'm going to take uh, 10 or 12 minutes to present that calendar and to present that challenge to students and that's going to cut our lesson down uh, significantly this week. Um, and so it's only going to be a six or seven minute lesson. We're going to be on in the story of Jacob and Esau this week. Um, and as we've been doing since Genesis 12, we're really looking at this big, the plan of God that he's setting up to redeem humanity. And we're looking at how God works um, and how God is is orchestrating that and how he may still work the same today. And so the principle that we're going to take out from Jacob's story is that God pursues or chases after uh, sinful people. That's what we see. That's what I see throughout the story of Jacob. He was chosen from birth to be this one that would continue Israel's line. Um, God visits him in a dream on his way while he's fleeing Esau and going to Laban and tells him, reiterates this promise that he gave to Abraham and Isaac. And yet Jacob is continually throughout his life not, not trusting God, not really committed to the Lord. He's lying, he's deceiving, he's cheating people. Um, there's little mention of God in his life. And then finally on his way back to see Esau to be reunited, uh, you have the... Christ comes and wrestles with Jacob uh, all night long, and eventually Jacob finally submits to God, and, and uh, the God of Abraham and Isaac really becomes the God of Jacob too. And it's this long, lifelong pursuit that God continually is chasing after Jacob, um, and then finally Jacob submits to the Lord, and uh, God still does this today. And um, we're going to actually try to tie our lesson and our challenge to students together uh, by saying that today God typically chases after and pursues people through other people, through Christians. That God pursued Jacob through dreams and visions and, and even an incarnate visit from Christ. Um, and today God pursues people in the same way, but he does it with other believers or with with believers chasing after unbelievers and so um, we should pursue the unbelieving unchurched people in our lives uh, as God leads us is kind of how we're going to tie those two together and you're going to hit on a little bit of both in your discussion time so you may start with just a quick review of Jacob's story in Genesis the reason we're not going to drill down into this story is because we don't have time and because our students have probably mostly heard this story like three or four or five times at least through Children's Church, and they should know the general flow of the story of Jacob and Esau. So you may do a quick review there um, and just hit that the main events of his life, uh, but most students will probably, they'll probably be able to rapid fire fill that in for you. Um, then we're going to move more into that specific principle that we're drawing out um, and we're just going to ask, what, uh, what does that reveal about God and about us? That the fact that God chases us, that he pursues us, what does that tell us about God? What does that tell us about humanity? Um, and there's a lot of things here. You may have to ask that question a couple times and poke and prod students into engaging, but there's lots of potential answers. 
Um, it shows us that God is, is genuinely loving. He really loves us and cares for us. He's the one that takes the first step of love, which is usually the hardest. Um, and he does that not only through sending Christ, but through chasing after us. Um, God chases and pursues uh, lost people. Uh, just like um, Christ's parable of the lost sheep, uh, he, he leaves the 99 and goes and chases after the one. And that, that takes real genuine love on God's part. Uh, it shows the humility of God, um, that he's willing to chase after us, especially after our continued rejection. We see that in Jacob's story. God continues to visit and chase after Jacob, even though Jacob is sinning and running away from God and not really listening, and he's had plenty of, of opportunities to repent, and he doesn't. God still chases him down. The story of Hosea is a great picture of that, that uh, this continued rejection, and yet um, Hosea is humble enough uh, to chase and chase and chase after Gomer, Gomer um, in the face of, of, of rejection, and God does that same thing for us. Uh, so it shows humility on God's part, even though we common perception of God is that he's prideful and haughty, uh, but he's actually humble in his chase after us. Um, shows us God's grace, that he doesn't leave us in the dark um, to find him. That's how the New Testament describes our sinfulness, that we're blind, that we're dead before we know Christ, and God doesn't leave us in that state to just hope that we somehow wonder and find God and stumble upon him, but God actually enters in and, and chases after us. Um, and then for ourselves, it reveals our, our sinfulness, how sinful humanity must be, that God has to relentlessly pursue us in order to get us to, uh, to submit to him. Um, our sin goes way deeper than we like to admit um, or like to talk about. Um, and so question three, you're going to move into how does this idea that God pursues us, that, this, that God chases after us, how does that motivate us? And this is, again, almost every week we're going to hit on this idea that our beliefs should accord with action. And so if we really believe that God um, chases after us and pursues sinners, then what's the corresponding action? What does that motivate us to do? Um, and it motivates us to pursue others. Uh, it motivates us to love um, the way that God loved us. This is kind of how the New Testament speaks of it, that we look over and over again at the gospel and what Christ did for us, um, and that mood moves and motivates us to do the same thing for others, that we love because Christ first loved us, and so we can love the people that are difficult to love, the people that reject our love. Uh, we can continue to uh, care for them. Uh, we can forgive even though we may see people that we don't think deserve our forgiveness. We forgive because Christ first forgave us, and so looking at God pursuing us should motivate us to pursue uh, the unbelievers in our lives in the same way. Um, even though it's difficult and challenging, we look at how God did it for us, and so we should likewise go and do that for other people. Um, and then you're just going to make that more tangible, more personal with the fourth question. Um, give a personal story. Ask them if they've ever pursued someone for Christ. So chased after an unbeliever, tried to witness to them, tried to point them in the right direction over and over and over again, and they just didn't have much success. Um, they felt discouraged, felt frustrated. Um, ask them if they've ever had that experience in their lives. Um, and if they nod, yes, see if someone will share an example of that. Uh, you should here have an example ready for yourself. Um, if you have one of how you've chased after someone, tried to witness to them, tried to point them to Christ, and uh, just aren't making much progress, aren't having any traction, um, and the frustration that comes with that, and then just point back to those previous questions that even though it's frustrating, it's difficult, it's discouraging, uh, we should look to the example that God has set for us and how he chased Jacob, how he chased Hosea, how he chased us, um, and we should continue to relentlessly pursue the unbelieving friends, family members, teammates, people in our lives, um, even when it's frustrating, even when there's not a lot of success. Uh, then questions five, six, and seven are more about that challenge for inviting unbelievers 
uh, to church. The first one is easy, just ask them what they think about that. We're 30 unbelieving students we want to have in the next five months visit us here at the church. Uh, what do they think about that? Is that a goal that's reasonable? Is it unreasonable? Is it really scary? Uh, is it exciting to them? How do they feel about that? Just what's their general reaction? Again, you can share your thoughts here um, to kind of get the ball rolling. Question number six, you're just going to ask if they have friends that aren't believers, if they have friends that aren't connected to a church. And one of two things could happen here. Uh, hopefully, all of the students say, yeah, I do. I have someone. There's several names in my head right now of people that I can invite, people that I know and I'm close enough to uh, that I know they don't have a church. I know they don't uh, trust in the Lord, and I, I could invite them. I could genuinely just extend this invitation to them. Um, but there may be some students that are homeschooled, go to a Christian school, don't do much extracurricular work uh, that say, I actually have no names in my head at all right now. I have no idea who I could bring, who I could invite. And so maybe this challenge isn't for me. And this is just an opportunity to gently reorient the challenge to those people. If you really don't have anyone in your life that you think you could invite, um, try to gently submit the challenge to them that that could be what they do this semester is if you don't have any friends any people in your life that don't know the gospel uh, maybe try to make a couple this semester uh, befriend your neighbor befriend a classmate a teammate uh, that you know probably doesn't know the lord try to build a relationship there a foundation to where you could eventually invite that person or share the gospel with that person um, that's really a whole other lesson that we could do about who our friends should be, what kind of friends we should have. And um, I think our, especially with youth, the, the closest friends that they should have are other believers, hopefully eventually people within this youth group. Um, but we should all have a couple people in our lives that aren't believers um, that we can be pursuing for Christ. Um, so submit that challenge to them if you have any students in your group that say, I can't think of anybody. Uh, reorient that challenge to them. And then the last one's another simple question uh, just about emotion. What, what do you guys feel? What makes you nervous about inviting uh, some of your unbelieving friends to church? Um, and there's a long list of potential answers here. I've just given a couple. Uh, rejection, people turning you down, saying no. Uh, a lot of times uh, it's even more fearful that your friend says yes and they actually come and you're uh, I've had that before where I bring a friend to church and I'm nervous. Are they going to think this is silly? Are they going to think this is stupid? Is the pastor going to say something dumb? Um, so could be nervous that they actually are going to come and then they're going to hate it. Um, they could ask questions. This could lead to more gospel conversations that can uh, bring up some nerves. And so just to ask how they feel, um, try, to, try to get them to open up, share their thoughts, share their feelings about witnessing to their friends. Um, and you can also reiterate something that um, I've said and will say in the lesson that the Sunday nights are going to be geared towards unbelievers. And so we're not going to be talking about uh, subjects that are way over their heads or uh, super sensitive and touchy things that you wouldn't want to bring your friend to hear. They're, these are going to be lessons designed. So that should ease up that second rejection or that second uh, reason for having nerves, hopefully. Um, so that's your questions. Sorry it's a bit of a hodgepodge this week. Um, I'll see you guys on Sunday. Let me know if you have any more questions. Thanks.